hard but no <laughs> we are we are live we are on the air so watch your language uh, so I, i'm uh, angela fell uh, and i'm from uh, wigan i live in wigan and i'm one of the founders of the neighborhood democracy movement i'll tell you a bit more about that in a bit but nice to nice to see you all who who would like to speak? Do you want me to pick hand the baton over to somebody? So yeah, so shall I hand it over to Vicka? Do you want to kind of introduce yourself and then hand it over to somebody else? Uh, I'm Vicky. Uh, I'm uh, retired, having worked, spent all my working life at Sheffield Poly and Sheffield Hanley University in student services. Um, and I currently coordinate a little group called Sheffield for Democracy that campaigns around structures in our constitution, voting reform. Uh, access to information, um, uh, uh, election of the House of Lords, all that kind of stuff. Kind of very, you know, things to do with our democratic structure. Yeah. And we've got to have, um, we have a Facebook page, we have a newsletter, we have a little steering group that meets, uh, we've been meeting online, obviously. I love the opportunity to network too, isn't there? Who would you like to hand the baton on to, Vicka? Jade. Jade. Hi. Hi, I'm Jade. Um, I started at East Marsh United in Grimsby and um, mm -hmm. we're working a lot on projects in the community. Um, so, Love that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, who, who would you like to nominate? And you can like say pass, you don't need to speak if you don't want to. That's your choice. Uh, Neil? Is it Neil? Uh, hi, uh, so I'm Neil Denton. Um, I'm an independent community mediator and practitioner in conflict transformation, uh, but I'm also a professor in practice with the Institute for Hazard Risk and Resilience at Durham. Uh, so I'm used to working with communities experiencing destructive conflict, but also working with communities that have experienced disaster. Um, and I'm reaching out now because the last year I've done less direct uh, practice, but I've been working with people like the Relationships Project um, to develop handbooks uh, for people to build bridges with each other. So I'm very happy to be here. Um, and I would like to uh, pass the baton. Um, Clive, understanding it might take a while to get there. <laughs> Not this time. Thank you, Neil. Glad to be here. I'm Clive Tuck and I'm, I'm a fellow at the Centre for Welfare Reform. I have been since 2010 when I was the sort of founder of a social enterprise called the Hub in Yeovil, based very much on the early uh, sort of personalisation uh, work that was done by the centre. Um, I, I'm now sort of developing a new project um, down in Weymouth, uh, much more around um, food security, which I want to talk about a little bit in more detail. So I'll, I'll pass, if I may, over to Anthony, last but not least. Hi, uh, yeah, my kids just came home from school, so there might be some noise in the background. Um, I work at the Centre for Alternative Technology in Wales on a project called Zero Carbon Britain and we recognise that community engagement in democracy essentially is one of the, or lack of community engagement in democracy is one of the biggest barriers to us um, decarbonising society so I'm very keen to hear more about how people are stimulating democratic engagement at the local level. Brilliant, welcome. Uh, and Caroline, Roseanne and uh, Agnieszka, I don't know if I said that right, if you could correct me. Do you want to say hello? Um, I'm, I'm Caroline Hutton. Um, uh, I live in Birmingham. I'm chair of Birmingham Food Council. Uh, I used to run Martino Gardens, which is a community garden in Birmingham. And now I'm on the board of Social Farms and Gardens. So I'm particularly interested in the place of um, community gardens and city farms in the place of, uh, in their role in community building. Lovely, thank you. Um, I'm Roseanne. Um, my background basically is running NGOs. Um, Kind of small, smaller NGOs um, working on behalf of stigmatized groups. Um, I'm based in Cornwall um, and I was interested in taking part in this because I've been more interested in local, local generation, uh, our local regeneration projects. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Uh, 
And Agnieszka, I don't know if I've said to your name correctly. Yeah, Agnieszka, uh, Aga in short. Uh, so I'm from uh, Hackney, Kirkhope, just uh, we just funding circle, which is um, growing, but we co collaborate with, um, I mean, we co kind of produce the whole project with uh, Equal Kirkhope from Yorkshire. And um, I'm, my role is um, community circle organizing and culture animating because we, we want to change culture of care and uh, uh, our like um, idea is also like to connect to places like gardens and uh, as the immediate you know uh, environment that can improve care in general so we kind of feel very ambitious and would love to collaborate oh, yeah, yeah. What a rich kind of group we are, aren't we? There's lots of <laughs> skills, knowledge, and experience here today. And, and uh, myself and Clive are hosting it. And the idea, I think, is that we talk for five minutes each. So I'll talk about the neighborhood democracy movement, and then uh, Clive will talk about his work. And then hopefully that will stimulate a conversation to go wherever uh, we we end up. Yeah. So shall shall I? Am I okay to just kick off and? tell you a little bit about the Neighbourhood Democracy uh, movement. Checks clock, notices time. Uh, <laughs> I, I got involved in the name. I, I really love the Centre for Welfare Reform and I really admire what Simon does. And at the beginning of lockdown, uh, he kind of started to gather people who were interested in cheering on a citizen-led response because the public narrative was very much about the service response or, or, and community was seen to be community organi organisations. And a couple of people where I live in a very small ward in Wigan, we've kind of had this bold idea uh, that we might like to see if we can become a self-organised, self-managed neighbourhood. Uh, because after 30 years of kind of working in communities and with communities and alongside, we all know that it's been a real difficulty to get any real form of power shift. And if there is a time to shift some power, it's usually at the back end of crisis, isn't it? These are the times when we can when we can do anything, if we can achieve anything. So I'll just share a little slide. I mean, this is kind of what we're saying. This is what we want to be, uh, a network for neighbourhoods to learn, share and mobilise for deeper change and for building real grassroots power and and, and citizen action, you know, and, and not, and I think what I really like about the movement for neighbourhood of democracy is that it is, we're intending to make things really accessible, but we don't want to do it on our own. You know, we want the land of just right porridge or, or a slice of toast, if you prefer it, you know, so that it's citizens, neighbourhoods, institutions and civic society, friends and allies working alongside each other but obviously kind of being aware of where the power can lie with that and, and, and just through the period of coming together this last year we've only properly like started to launch anything from February or March time but this is kind of what we noticed the the group uh, 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 as we came together I'm gonna to make that look a bit bigger counter you know that if we're thinking about porridge, we saw that too hot, too cold, and perhaps some just right across the across the field, really. So kind of neighborhoods were we saw responses that copied old power institutional approaches, you know, or sometimes made decisions about the help others could have, like, no, I'll do your shopping, but I'm not buying cigarettes for you. You know, or adopted a real hierarchical approach. So we saw like the too hot. And then we saw the two calls, you know, where people thought it was somebody else's job, you know, that it's the council's job to do that, or that they've been trained to become a good consumer of services and contracted that out. Or, like, we set up a network here of 112 streets where I live, thought they needed permission to do things, or didn't have any connection to neighbours. Like, they're just right, kind of, like, connected what they had and kept it small and beautiful and looked at kind of mutuality and not just the helper and the 
and the helps, you know, so we, we saw that picture and then we saw the picture really within institutions of like Too Hot where there was real mistrust. I certainly found it very difficult to organise here and be supported. And I live in Wigan, which is one of the kind of, you know, kind of ones that are moving closer to uh, community power. But areas that were unable to differentiate between community organisation and the people. Uh, those that encouraged individuals and groups to join the system rather than connect with each other. Like you need a DBS to go and visit Fred across the road, you know, that's kind of where we're moving to. Uh, and saw the rise of mutual aid as an opportunity to get citizens to act on their behalf, to fulfil the requirements of the like risk stratification. Like here we could have some champions, let's recruit them in. And then we have the other side where kind of a neighbourhoods were abandoned, they just didn't show up. Or they used the resource uh, to to tell neighbours when they were organising what they were getting wrong or what they were doing wrong. I know a neighbourhood who got a letter for uh, putting a Christmas tree illegally in the street. You know, they, they kind of, they, there was that side of it too. You know, but, and then we saw the just right where, uh, where people kind of built the neighbourhood response and the neighbour response within their approach and what they were doing and wrapped the support around them and then used the power that they had for like some of the big stuff and the strategic stuff that helps you to get things done quicker. And then there were the politicians too, they were at a similar, you know, there were those who wanted to be the hero, there was those who kind of didn't come out and then there were those who really convened and hosted it. So that's our anecdotal uh, kind of vision of it, what we saw, and that's what we would like some kind of resource to explore a little a little bit kind of further in, in some responses. Because we saw that those that had perhaps had experienced crisis before kind of built it in a bit better. And those who were already shifting, like had maybe invested in asset-based community development or community organising, neighbourhood plans, local area uh, coordination, Budzog, which I can never say, uh, or like the other side, like the ones that come through transitions town and uh, shift control, you know, the permaculture movement and uh, extinction rebellion areas where that was kind of like coming from climate uh, or coming in from poverty, uh, you, you, you could see that. Uh, there, there was a little more kind of uh, life there. And so what we'd like to do is turn the anecdote into research and really shine a light on what works well and connect people up because at the minute, very often for neighbourhoods, it depends on what the approach is in where you live and whether there's funding, you know, where, you, where you're located. So we'd like to bring people together and share uh, resources. And we've had a little bit of money off local trust to, to do that. So this is the lens that we're, the draft lens that we've kind of said that we, we want to be. And we've, we've got a little website. And so far, I can't say that, if, you know, we, we've had, we've got a letter, an open letter on the website for, that people can sign up to. And 134 people, our organisations have signed that so far. And then we've got another 58 orgs on the mailing list but we've not properly formalised what it is that people are signing up to yet. So I, I wouldn't, the, the supporters and, the, and the, they're, they're aligned. And that includes like interested local authorities because we want it to, we want to be able to get to work in that liminal space in the, in the middle. Mm -hmm. So like we've got Norwich, York, Derby, Burnsley and Doncaster and Southern Health NHS Foundation Trust who are uh, expressing some interest. And then we've got some of the think tanks and some of the groups like People's Powerhouse uh, and Same Skies and Opus uh, and Compass are a partner as well. Uh, a couple of universities, York and Salford. Uh, quite a few seed community development practitioners or people working in this field. Some political parties like the Yorkshire Independents. And then people from, if we look at what we've got, then we've got like Wigan, Sefton, Cambridge, Coventry, Grimsby, Sheffield, Ludlow, Lancashire, Wigan uh, and Lee. Uh, 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 my Lee friends will be annoyed with me if I don't mention that Lee's in Wigan too. Uh, Leeds, 
uh, Barrow, Holker, Cleves, Colville, Bury, Leicestershire, Brighton, Charlton, Manchester, Knowlesley and Derby and Suffolk. So we, we're getting a little bit of a range. And, and, and the next step really is what we're working on the website so that we can start to uh, connect that up and people can see and we can start to connect people with each other and we can start producing resources. So we've done three or four little kind of events inviting people in and started creating material that we can share. Uh, so we're not advocating that there's a particular way or that you need a certain type of training. We just want to make it simple, accessible, connect people up uh, and like grow some power. Yeah, so. Uh, thank you. That's uh, my, more than five minutes, but uh, I'm done. I'm going to pass the baton over to uh, to Clive to give some inputs, and then we can have a chat together. Thank you, Angela. That's really helpful. I don't know if anybody's got any questions at this stage because uh, the the whole purpose of today is to really just paint a picture, set a scene, and encourage kind of a discussion and and really for people to kind of explain what their own challenges might be because we recognize that there's a lot around how localism has sort of allowed different areas in the country i'm at the other end i'm i'm sort of at the most southern tip of the south coast um in weymouth um and my my work is um based around there being an asset that the council, the local council in Weymouth didn't even know they had until the local farmer handed the keys back and said, I don't want to rent the land anymore. So it came as a bit of a kind of sideswipe to them and they didn't know what to do. So fortunately I was able to get engaged in a community discussion, a, an assembly over several months about what this asset could be used for. And, and, and initially it was very clear as because lockdown uh, was soon to follow us. And the response overwhelmingly was that this should be an asset for the community. It should be about food production and it should be about um, enabling people to enjoy health and well-being with all that being outdoors and communing with nature is about. Um, but from my point of view, the local and global picture is vastly changing and it has been particularly over the last 30 years. And for me, we need to radically rethink how we engage with our communities, with the land and with our food, but whilst addressing climate and ecological emergency. And that's a balance here that we might need to think about. And the importance of equitable access and connection to nature. So a lot of my work locally is around what they call a recovery curriculum that I'm working on with schools that want to enable children to return to schools where home education has been patchy, but that they can begin to recognize the importance of being outdoors, but more than just seeing it, but experiencing it and appreciating the need to protect that life-giving environment. So, um, we, we've been thinking a lot about that connection to nature and how we can dismantle those barriers of engagement that are faced by people that experience the greatest disadvantage. Um, because that seems the most crucial agenda for the next 30 years. Um, so in, in, in the discussions I'm now having with the councillor about how do we redefine our vision so that it is fit for purpose and, and, and how can we make sure that we've created a vision that is in inclusive, yes, and accessible, and, and it's, it creates this sort of regenerative urban agricultural space, you know, because food binds us all together. It's one of those common things that is so intrinsic to survival that we've learned a lot by lockdown. And um, so there are things we're doing, some examples which, you know, we can discuss but, but the fact that the town had to face up to sort of food insecurity and, and started digging their own gardens and started putting lettuce and kale in their own window boxes, that didn't come with an instruction. That was almost a spontaneous response by many people. And as Angela's already touched on, there is a need to respect and engage with existing structures, but a real need to kind of sort of shift 
there's a balance here and about how we open up an opportunity and work collectively to let our communities have much more control and say and 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 power in that in that paradigm really so that's tumble down it's 27 acres of land it's uh, it's got protected spaces it's going to operate as a community farm that there, there will be organizations having access to use it for their own organizations local community groups and schools and we will be developing a veg box scheme so some traditional ways of running a social farm um, but I just wanted to kind of ask for help really because initially the project group started and still is very much a council centric operation even though aspirationally they wanted to be community led and I'm kind of in between the two seeing that yes we need investment yes we needed to get it off the ground but how can I dismantle that power and share it in a way that makes it equitous so I come with more questions than answers and I hope today we can just start to maybe share what's going on around and have a collective voice that can grow from this and what resource we may need to achieve that. So I'm going to end there and see if we can start to kind of get going with some, I'm just very time conscious really, but um, you're all here for a reason. I'd be interested to hear what they are. Yeah. And also Thanks. what struck you, I suppose, you know, what you came for and what struck you. Yeah. Mm. Caroline wants to come in, yeah. Hi. Um, um, so, first of all, Angela, really interested to hear about the work that you've been doing. And I think what you have described is the complexity um, and all of the tensions between all the different ways of working. So, um, uh, really delighted to hear that you're doing it and good luck because sure as hell that's what, we, what you need in that kind of complex environment. Um, uh, Clive, I want to uh, check that you're aware of Social Farms and Gardens, which I'm on the board of, um, uh, and check that you're a member. It's free um, because uh, they have an enormous range of resources and an opportunity for you to connect with other people who have run similar and different projects. Um, so, uh, and one of the things which Social Farms and Gardens has learned over the years is that the land is the easy bit, <laughs> actually. The building community organization particularly when it's have you've got the council has got their way of doing things and they're there is 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 the challenging bit um, um and so um yes you can use land to build community but there will always be that tension about um, um needing permission which is one of the things that you talked about angela and that that tension there and that I have enormous respect for people who work in the public sector, but I'm aware that their mindset is very different from those of us probably and the, the rest of the room here who have worked in the voluntary sector and social enterprises. And there is that willingness to dip and dive and do things very directly with one another which is very often what is needed. Um, uh, so uh, I'm just going to do make one point about um, food security versus um, um, social benefits, uh, because as someone who's run a community garden and is an allotmenteer now and, and all of that kind of stuff, I'm completely into growing my own food and community gardening and growing in communities. Um, I think it's a very different thing from the scale that is needed for food security. Um, and I think we can get into difficulties if we think that growing our own food is going to solve food security. Um, I think solving food security is something where you need the scale of government involved um, because um, 
uh, I mean, I'm sure, I mean, in, Bir you know, in Birmingham, it's a long way for me to get to a farm. OK, and in Weymouth, you're probably a lot closer to to farms. Well, you are because from what you're talking about, but the scale there and the scale that, w that is needed in order to produce food, which people don't go, oh, gosh, that's expensive, um, is, is a challenge. I'm going to stop there. before, Otherwise, I'll start ranting. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. And I will add that we are connected to the social care and farms and also the community supported agriculture. So we're part of an incubator program for that project at the moment. But I do take that point that scale is significant in the equation where food and cost and respect for the climate is concerned. Yeah, that's a helpful observation. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, Caroline, I'd like to kind of thank you for your input as well. And I have got a little bit of like a challenge of that. I wondered if you could possibly have a think about it and uh, maybe put something in the chat towards the end of the session is that we know it's complex. Now, I know that you've got lots of skills and experience. So I'd love to know what you could offer the neighbourhood democracy movement or what the neighbourhood democracy movement as well could do for, for you and your work. And... Uh, a tip for the movement just to kind of hold that in mind for towards the end of the workshop. Cheers. I think Anthony wants to come in or we just move towards the camera. I was thinking about it. Yeah. Um, I suppose all, all that's on my mind in relation uh, this tumble down farm idea sounds really interesting. Um, I just wonder if you how much kind of similar things in other sectors might be a model or not depending on how much kind of revenue you see there being from the farm in terms of veg box schemes and stuff um we've recently come across a um a kind of renewable power thing that oldham county council did or oldham council i don't know what if they're a county or not um but they started a community energy scheme and transferred it to community ownership through a kind of a share process, which they kept some shares in, but every size of shareholder only has an equal vote. So although the council still has quite a few shares, they don't have a dominant voice. So it's a much more equitable kind of management structure now. Um, so I suppose I'm just suggesting looking at other sectors for, for models that might work I suppose. I think in the area actually Anthony we, we, we there's been discussion around uh, community benefit society or some sort of community-led structure through memberships um, again we can only produce a certain amount of food so we're actually not going to feed everybody's needs therefore we have to kind of work together with other areas so Portland that is very um, beaten by the weather can produce different types of food products and therefore whether we can connect locally because we do have a lot of farms nearby so that we can hopefully reduce the road miles and production costs and co-produce and you know almost have a suite of food that is available but is produced by a number of different organizations within the network as well is certainly what's being discussed but for me it's also about how do I prize the farm off the council even though they say they want it to be community-led when it actually continues not to be <laughs> that that's quite challenging for me at the moment yeah neil you want to come in yeah hi um two things that link to lots of things for me um so um i think after disasters network we're we're on uh, two missions um, one is to translate research into policy um, and and as you said Angela you know um, at this point in a crisis uh, there is there is an energy for change and it's similar to the energy that I work with in, in conflict and um, so I, I'd never call it a, an opportunity because it's a disaster um, but it, it is a shift in the equilibrium and um, so um, I love your porridge slide um, and there is oodles of stuff that backs up this from a disaster recovery um, setting. So I think there are um, 
Um, there are things we can bring that strengthen the arguments about movements that have been happening for a long time in the UK that says we need to understand the power of community and connectivity um, and say, actually, if we're looking at a disaster recovery setting, those two things link together. So we're, um, we've, we've been setting up little sort of uh, research groups around the world um, that we think know what they're talking about. So Daniel Aldrich from the States did the work around the tsunami and earthquake in Japan um, and has said, actually, um, social connectivity was more important in terms of whether people lived or died than the height of the seawall or the height of the tsunami wave. Um, there have been local examples coming out around your talk in terms of which, which areas are getting it right. So the stuff between Belong and the University of Kent that absolutely backs up what you're saying and is now published saying local authorities that set the right tone for these things and places that said this is how to do it actually have done better. Um, so I'm happy to share with anybody um, connections of that and also we've tried translating some of it um, because certainly as a practitioner um, I read some of the research and it takes me a very long time to think so what? Um, so that's, that's strand one. Um, strand two in our mission is to turn policy into practice. Um, so I have seen oodles of reports that say um, actually this is all around communities being active and caring for each other um, but it's also and that's easy in terms of bonding capital so people like me sticking together so we will look out for each other and that's what we do in times of threat or disaster. What is much more tricky and what I haven't seen is bridging capital so our group us talking to them um, and actually what I think we've seen is quite a lot of outgroup blaming. So who's spreading the virus, who's placing it at risk, who's deserving or not deserving. Um, and I haven't seen anyone turn up with anything that says this is how to do this. Um, so I've been working with the Relationships Project um, and Caroline, I agree with you, it is all about relationships here. It's just how we do it um, to come up with practical toolkits. I've just shared one. Um, about one, how do we understand the typology of volunteering and people, are, and I don't really like it called volunteering because I think we've just helped our neighbours. Um, and, you know, let's move away from this volunteer army um, and just go, actually, how do we harness some of this energy that's happened within communities? But also, really importantly, how do we start to cross those divides and bring groups together based on common interest? And I'm doing that because of Clive's conundrum. Um, so I have seen uh, across the world in practice, um, but certainly across the UK, lots of people in power saying, well, we'd, we'd like to devolve the power, um, but they haven't really got their act together yet. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm hoping that the Bridge Builders Toolkit is a really tangible way of developing those networks at a local level. Um, I have also seen people clamouring to do what they call co-design, co-production. Uh, what was the last one I heard? A drastic democratisation. Um, I think it's a form of alliteration. It has to work in a policy land. God knows why. Um, but um, trying to do that and actually creating conflict and reducing resilience within communities. And that's because whether they're well-intentioned or not, what they tend to do is create competition and discord around access to resource and access to power. Um, and again, this is why we're saying if you are going to create a new social covenant, so Danny Kruger's crew, um, which, you know, they've got tick for well intentions, but I think needs some of the methodology. Um, if you are going to create that new social covenant, you need to weave a social fabric that is sufficiently robust to place that covenant upon. Um, so that's that's it for me um, for now. Happy to, uh, but I, yeah, I will carry on otherwise. Um, but happy to share practical toolkits from the relationship project, and also potted bits of research that you can roll up and beat people with in a collaborative, um, collaborative way. Or sharing way. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Lovely, lovely. Thank you, Andrew. Well, can I just come back to you on that point? In terms of the extensive work that you've done, 
not only globally, but across the UK to look at areas of research um, and the production of a toolkit that in some way, I guess, acts as a response to some of that. If there was funding and if, if, if today is as much about building networks as it is about recognizing areas where we need to grow and develop this work, do you have a sense of where you would want to shine the light and where funding would be helpful? Say that to again. Say that to me again in in, in a slightly different way. So to, uh, what I think what I'm hearing across the UK, where what would my dream list be in terms of geographies? Or explain it to me, Clive. I'm having a thick moment. No, no. Um, if if there's obviously quite a good overview currently of what's going on around this movement, in your view. Are there areas which are missing or that if there was funding available would be a good area to shine a light and say this particular area needs more focus or this particular example is highlighting something that we now need to kind of understand better or give more road miles and demonstrate that more and see if it's got legs? Is there a sense of what's working well yet? Yeah, um, um, I think this is the, um, uh, I, I, for the last five years I've been doing private practice, so bad things happen, people ring Neil up and I go and help. Um, I've done very little looking out, um, networking, development stuff, so really I've been doing that in the last year um, when I realised that doing mediation and conflict via Zoom is rubbish. Um, so, uh, but what, and what I've seen is that ironically the community connecting kind of um, universe is not particularly well connected um, and that people talk to me and, I, and I've, I've learned about asset based things and people say oh but is that asset based or is that asset based community development I'm just like oh I, I don't really know um, and are we using arts or are we using farms or are we using poetry it's like well, I don't really know that either um, what I've been focusing on is that sense of bridging capital. Um, yeah. So what we've tried to do in that handbook is combine conflict transformation, which is there is an energy within difference and disagreement that can bring people together in ways that solve a problem and strengthen a relationship. Nonviolent communication, which says underneath judgment and blame, there is a request for unmet need to be met. Um, and mediation, which is Galtung's mediation, which is really peace building. Um, and we've tried to stick it all together and just throw it out there um, into the world and just say, actually, this is the bit that links together bonding capital, which you can do in any which way you want. Because I think culturally it has to work with how we do things around it. Um, so I grew up in Birmingham. Um, and there weren't many farms to Gantley. I, re I remember being taken on a school trip to see a cow. Um, that, was, that was very exciting at the time. Um, and, and that works in places. I think what we've tried to do is say, and linking also works in lots of different ways. So that connection between community and power source, there were loads of different models around that in terms of contracts, power sharing, shares that uh, our colleague from CAT talked about. What I don't think there is, is um, a really helpful resource around bridging. Um, and you can, so what, I suppose what we're saying is that you can, do, you can do bonding however you like, you can do linking however it works in terms of trust, um, but unless you've got that connectivity between groups at a different level based on coming together on shared interest, then the bit in the middle ain't working. So, what we're really pushing for is saying that is, we think that's the missing bit and we think that's the missing bit globally. Um, and we've talked to colleagues in the UN, um, World Health Organization, et cetera, et cetera. And they've all just gone, oh yes, yes. We've been, we've been saying that for, for years, but you're right. We've never really written down how to do it. So that, that's, that's, I think that's where our focus is at the moment. And that's what we're trying to link together um, so I'm writing a Lancet opinion piece at the moment, just saying you can talk about socially devolved and community led responses and mitigation and risk to communities and grab bags and all of this kind of stuff. But if you haven't got that community connectivity, it doesn't work. 
and there's stuff coming out of the US that isn't yet published but will be in the next few weeks that basically says um, you can plot COVID um, infection rates um, by um, social connectivity. Um, so generally in places where there is stronger social connectivity, the infection rates are lower, apart from in those places where there's really strong bonding capital, but very weak bridging. And I think we've seen that in some of the groups where we're, we're talking vaccine hesitancy or um, you know, communities that have high infection rates, a lot of those are really well connected with each other, but that level of trust between different groups and therefore with the state isn't there. So I'm listening to an uncle in the community as opposed to someone that knows about epidemiology. Um, and it's, so it's, it's that interplay, I think that's there, but we, we keep coming back and I've challenged it in lots of different ways, but I think we keep coming back to that sense of, it's the bridging and the, the linking and dealing with difference yeah. that is so important. Yeah. Thank I you. think that's going to be a really useful tool because I mean I live in Wigan and like we kind of predominantly voted to leave Europe and there's been a, an awful lot of division since then so I think it's at the minute we're just trying to build the community again through the social stuff but we'll come to the bridging and then it's the same with the organisations that are operating at the app local level. And then the ones across the borough, if we're thinking about community wealth building. So I can see how we can use that at those like three different levels locally, just in the borough where I live. That's a really useful tool. I've, I've got it. I've not read it, though, I'll be honest. <laughs> it's on the <my> list. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Do you think is there a need then for this neighbour democracy movement? What do you think? Is that me? Uh, for anybody, I'm just wondering, just opening that out. Do we, you know? Yes. That's part of being here today is like chatting to people, see if they want to get involved. Like, how, how do you see yourself having a role? Or, or, or is, is, is the, you know, should we be doing it? Should we be looking for funding? I can see Anthony really has got something to say, haven't you? I just, I just want to add to that question really to Neil is like, is this a kind of antidote to polarisation? Is that kind of what you're talking about really? Yeah. That, me, where I live at the, that bottom level. Yeah. Yeah. And people power. Yes. Um, so yeah, my work um, uh, has been with lots of people that others would call extremist. Um, so finding space within that. Um, after the terror attacks in Brussels um, and Paris, I worked in Molenbeek, which is a community where a lot of the perpetrators were said they uh, well, were found to have come from. Um, and so it's it's built on some fairly gnarly practice, um, but it's it's what I think I see. I think we're, we've become better at shouting than we have at listening. Um, I think we've become more polarized or tribal um, and the legacy of things like Brexit have led us more to be what shirt are you wearing or scarf are you wearing um, than um, that listening and dialogue and understanding the difference. So absolutely. But I think if we're going to do that, then that movement to democracy at a, a neighbourhood level, which I think is, is crucial um, if we're going to do this and if we're seeing the challenge to the town centre that we are, um, it's it. it I think that's the way forward, but if we do that in ways that aren't attentive to how we fall out, how we refocus ourselves, um, how we see common need, but also different need, then we're just creating lots of problems at a micro level. Can I just follow on from that? Sorry, if this is going off on one a bit, but how, um, given your answer to that was kind of yes, to what extent do you feel like it's a, a constant and or losing battle against the context of a society which is constantly pushing us into further polarisation? Like we're not going to kind of suddenly win that battle, are we? No. Um, um, no. We're not, um, but it, it, it depends, you know, it, we can either look back, um, I did some work with the guy that runs the Centre for Conflict Resolution in Palestine, um, and uh, was just saying, I, I asked exactly that question, how do you operate um, when the rockets are still flying, 
um, when um, uh, the uh, the expansionism is still happening, when the walls are still there. Um, and he just says, if you if you lose all hope to local level, so we talk about whose football is bounced off whose car. Um, we talk about whose kids are playing with each other. We talk about those everyday things that tie us together. Um, similarly, the stuff in Sarajevo, how did they hold themselves with care on the face of massive external division forces? Um, and it just says, you know, we have the opportunity to keep ourselves together. And by keeping ourselves together, we can then start to pick all of the separate bits of opportunity that will come down from state but to be able to articulate them in ways that means that we are all conscious of everybody else's need. Um, so as opposed to the divide and rule approach, which is kind of what I see happening from government, um, they can try, but if those networks and connections are open at a local level, then if one bit of the system fails from our perspective, then we all stand up. So it, it can, it depends how you, how you see it in terms of do you want a revolution or not the same processes have been used in lots of different contexts but um but i, I think otherwise we just give up um and start arming ourselves um and i'm not really i don't think i do terribly well at that yeah. we'll start uh, so. i love our way out of it haven't we yeah mm. yeah um, sorry <laughs> Go on, Mark. Given given your your statement, I like that, that mediation and conflict work via Zoom is rubbish. Um, <laughs> it is is the solution, or is part a big part of the solution? Kind of getting offline. Like, can you do? Can you do neighbourhood democracy movement building online, or does it have to be in person? Do you think? Uh, okay, I probably need to clarify my statement. I am rubbish at mediation on Zoom. Um, it's because I, yeah, uh, this dog is too old for this new trick. Um, so I, I can't get over not being able to feel the room. Um, I can't get over not being able to see, look in someone's eyes and see them at the same time. Um, it's those bits. I, I have seen um massively powerful whatsapp groups zoom networks online things with people that have never touched this sphere before um but i also think uh in in the ideal world as hopefully uh things uh return to a more physical space um that there were conversations best had offline on land yeah on land and online, the two yeah. together really, because for some people it's open doors, hasn't it? And and for lots of people they haven't even got access. Yeah. So you know, the, 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 it, there is a balance to be had. I was yeah. with a, a really great organisation in Wales, uh, something eyes, vocal eyes, I think they're called. They've created this brilliant online stuff around involving people in decision making connected to parish councils and it's a lovely tool but there needs to be another arm to that too doesn't there because otherwise we leave people behind and they're not included in but it's a three three-way process isn't it i think uh, caroline wants to come back in do you yeah. I just, I'm just aware that uh, agnesia is having to leave and we haven't heard from vicky or roseanne I wonder if if either of them. And uh, Jade Jade messaged me actually to say that she had bad connection and had to go. I'd love to have heard about the East Marsh stuff because they haven't had bread planned over. The invitation, Roseanne and Agnew, if you're around. And Vicky. Vicky. I, I, I'll, I'll just say a little bit. I mean, I mean it, in a way, I've come to this because I was wanting to find out what the Centre for Welfare Reform was up to, <laughs> having heard of it, it's in my city and yeah, and uh, so, you know, I'd like to know what's going on. Um, like, like I said, I, I'm involved much more in campaigning, which is very different, I think, from lots of the things that you're all doing, but very interested to hear it all and all about things I haven't thought about. So I'm, I'm, I'm here as an observer really to kind of find out rather than to tell you that what I'm doing is kind of fits into the, the kind of models that you're talking about. So I hope that's okay for me just to kind of be here and learning. 
Yeah. Yeah. And that, that grows out, doesn't it? That grows out of the ecosystem, doesn't it? If we connect people together, uh, I, I love the camaraderie principles for connecting people together. And then we have asset based community development, whereas community organising and campaigning grows out of that, doesn't it? When you can connect people, people need to know that they have got some power and agency and then they can go and campaign or they need to be kind of push so much that they want to take direct action on something, don't they? I mean, I, I, I mean, my little group, my, my Sheffield of Democracy group, we're working with the Sheffield Climate Alliance. Um, they've got some kind of money around developing a, a centre to, for kind of, um, uh, you know, climate change and education around climate, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, we're doing a little bit of kind of cross organisational work yeah, and learning how to work with people who've got very different perspectives and, uh, you know, have come from a different kind of, come from a different kind of position and are trying to work together. Um, so what you were saying, people have been saying is kind of uh, quite interesting for me to hear about all that, but thank you very much. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> that was your computer, Neil, wasn't it? So I think we've, we've only got a couple of minutes left, haven't we? So I suppose, shall we finish off with perhaps something that struck us or something that we might want to, you know, connect with or a closing thought or something. What is it that we can do together that we can't do apart? For me also the connection between um, people being around people and you know connected in in the sense that organizations all hope to work together and effectively have they managed to achieve that and what that what that might need to look like i think that i think neil's introduced the sort of bridging capital idea is quite a powerful one really because you know even even when certain voluntary organizations come together to go for sort of grant funding there's still quite a high degree of self-interest there, uh, usually in the voluntary sector around survival a lot of the time. And it, it's kind of just trying to work out um, how you get alignment and how you kind of share purpose a lot of the time when, when people may have a different sort of take or view or understanding about how some problems have emerged. So there's a lot of mediation involved in this process that's quite sort of stark from what you've been saying. And what I've been hearing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I think we're we're in some really interesting times um, at the moment. Um, we have had uh, a year plus of outgroup othering. Um, we have had a, in the UK, um, my words, um, a governmental response that is entirely focused on behavioural economics and nudge um, and is underpinned by veneer theory. So that concept that we are all savages waiting to get out um, and we'll rip each other apart at the best opportunity. Um, and we're now, um, and we've got lots of people that have massively suffered and are traumatised and not used to being in contact with each other. Um, so as individuals, I think we need to commit to how we re-enter our social realm, listening and treating each other with kindness and politeness. Um, I think very much as organisations, um, we need to, if there is latent conflict about resource, we need to put that on the table and start really talking about it as, as organisations. Otherwise, we're just going to go back to those days. I remember mediation between youth providers when they were talking about their young people like they were currency. Um, so these are our young people, not your young people. It's like, sorry, what? Um, so so I, I, think, um, I think we can set an example and keep a strong voice in this field. Otherwise, we'll, um, we'll be commissioned. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else want uh, 10 seconds before we kind of... Clavenagh, thank you for uh, 
coming today and listening and sharing and uh, having such a great, rich conversation. I, yeah, I think thank it's, you. Been, it's been really interesting. Yeah, yes, I think it's been really interesting too. Thank you. Yeah. Got a final word, Clive, if you want it. Well, I'm, I just absolutely think that the message I'm hearing is that we've got to we've got to strike against the odds. The political landscape isn't strong. We've come out of lockdown. There's a lot of natural.